Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Since 1990, the Vegetarian Society has been following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education as we've grown to become one of the largest vegetarian societies in the nation. We're delighted to have with us tonight Dr. Richard Openlander. For more than 40 years, Dr. Richard Openlander has been studying the connection between our food choices, our health, and the immense impact these choices have made on our environment, and his research and experiences in this field have compelled him to share this crucial and timely information with the world. Dr. Openlander's research has taken him to every area in the United States and to countries on nearly every continent. He is the president and founder of an organic plant-based food production company and education business, co-founder of an animal rescue and sanctuary, along with his wife, Jill, and he's given hundreds of lectures, presentations, interviews, and open discussions on the topic of food choice. Dr. Openlander is also the founder of the nonprofit organization, Inspire Awareness Now. Dr. Openlander has authored two groundbreaking books, Comfortably Unaware, The Relationship Between Your Food and Our Future, and Food Choice and Sustainability, Why Buying Local, Eating Less Meat, and Taking Baby Steps Won't Work. Dr. Openlander's presentation tonight is entitled Food Choice and Sustainability, Tipping Point Realities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Openlander. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. That was great. <laughs> A Ashley, I know you can do better than that. Yeah. This is supposed to be the happy state, and this is the first time that I've set foot on Hawaii. So let's try that again. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. Much better. Much, yeah. much, much better. Much happier. Knowing and doing. This is planet Earth. It's a, it's a planet we live on. Well, most of us live on this planet anyway. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been here for four and a half billion years, with life thriving on it for three billion years. Hominids, such as Australopithecus, came into the picture about four million years ago. And our species, Homo sapiens, separated ourselves out from that group at around 100 to 200,000 years ago. Put into perspective, our planet and life on it's been here for quite some time, four billion years before we were. Agriculture and civilization began about 6,000 years ago and we started domesticating animals and plants. And then industrialization took place with factories popping up everywhere in the mid 1800s to early 1900s. So with this extraordinarily long history of life balancing itself so very well in a natural Gaia type of manner for so very long on our planet, we humans came along and began the path toward creating serious damage to our planet, to ourselves, to other species in only the last 150 years. A snapshot of our planet today reveals this. We're running out of land and fresh water. Pollution and human-induced greenhouse gas emissions are threatening our, our atmosphere and waterways and negatively affecting our climate. Our oceans and sea life are being destroyed. We're losing habitat, ecosystems, and biodiversity with mass extinctions occurring at a, at a rate that we haven't seen since the dinosaurs were lost 65 million years ago. Nearly 900 million people in the world are suffering from hunger. One half of all of our topsoil has been lost with certain regions becoming completely desertified. All this while we witness escalating rates of emerging and chronic diseases regarding our own human health. There are some scientists who predict that time is running out for us. We may only have 50 to 75 years remaining. These are researchers. They're not doomsdayers. I call all this global depletion, the loss of our primary resources on Earth, as well as our own health. It's still sustainability. I just think we need to hear it from a different direction. And we need to hear the whole story through an unfiltered lens. And for me, the story is changing from one of needing to increase awareness to one of a time bomb that's ticking away. Well, these are just some of the many timelines we're going to be discussing. For instance, 
phosphorus and, and nitrogen balance is irreversibly altered today. Oceanic warming will continue with rising seas for centuries from now, even if we stop all greenhouse gas emissions from all fossil fuel use today. 420 million acres of tropical rainforest will be destroyed by the year 2030 and mostly replaced by livestock and crops to feed them. We have about five or six generally recognized categories of generations of humans living right now. The younger uh, X, Y, and Z generations are over at the, at the left end over there, and the, the millennials are in here somewhere. I, I can't often find the millennials because they're too busy texting on their phones and playing with photos. <laughs> but, you know, and over at this end, we have the, the greatest generation. Uh, but, you know, they're in their 90s, and uh, they've done so much for us, but, but they're also the generation with their parents that unintentionally began some of the irreversible loss of our environment. So that leaves the two or three generations in the middle. And we have a daunting task in front of us regarding this environment issue, I think, to first realize they were damaging our planet, and to what extent? That's a first big step. And then how to somehow fix it. Well, when I step back and look at this, I see a picture of tremendous responsibility, opportunity of profound historical magnitude. My generation and the generation of our three adult children, those two or three generations in the middle here that are in somewhat of a leadership position today are in a unique position to save Earth as we know it and save life on it now and allow a livable future for those who inherit the Earth after us. Or we could ignore things. That's another choice. Act like nothing's happening or when we get around to it and allow it to continue on its current path to possibly be destroyed. What's at stake? the extinguishing of our own species and thousands of other species. We can essentially make or break humanity. That could be at stake. And if you think that this is an overstatement or it's a, a wild exaggeration or that this problem is entirely related to climate change, well, then that doubt, that skepticism and lack of action all become part of the problem. So certainly something needs to change. W what is it that we're doing to our environment? What, what needs to change? And importantly for me, how, how fast does this change need to put, take place? Can we get around to it, let's say, tomorrow or the next day? The answers to those questions are pretty easy. We need to stop those practices and habits that we administer every single day on a collective basis, globally, that create an unnecessary and proportionally large resource footprint, beginning with the largest footprint of all. Food, what we eat, and our agricultural systems. It's a larger resource guzzler than anything else we do. It also happens to be the easiest to change. Well, okay, I mean, as compared to mandated global population control, I mean, the, the culling of other humans to get us down to the three billion mark as we were in 1950, that's a little more manageable. So uh, let's see, you know, we can remove a few of you in the back row over there, and uh, okay, this whole side, you need to go. So that, that's gonna happen, that's not gonna happen. Or the immediate elimination of all fossil fuel use which isn't going to happen anytime soon. And you know, even if it did, it really, it really wouldn't address a number of aspects of global depletion. Well, how quickly do we need to change our habits, our footprint? I can tell you this, it's, it's not a time for baby steps. Not at all. It requires big person steps because it needs to be done right now. It needs to be done today. Uh, now, we're on very real timelines. So let's take a closer look at all this and see what it means. Many of the choices that we make in life will have a profound impact on something else in the world, especially with things you consume, like food. It's one of the major disconnects we seem to live with. What you do here might affect something over there, and how to start looking outside the microcosm or the, or the bubble that all of us tends to tend to live in, and then how to encourage others, perhaps, to do the same. Well, we're once again going to examine the word sustainable pretty carefully today, because this word's constantly misused and it's morphed into so many different meanings to suit so many different needs. And for most people, it still refers to our energy sector or to waste, how, what, and when to recycle, or even to our economic or social sustainability. But rarely, if ever, is food choice properly connected to sustainability efforts, especially the raising and eating of animals, despite the enormous effect. It's simply too challenging for everyone, culturally, socially, and yet this word, sustainable, is the most important word in our vocabulary that we need to define correctly. Well, because if we get this word wrong, well, the consequences aren't so good, are they? We humans have reached a critical and fragile point in our evolutionary journey as a species. Just in the past hundred years, a blink of an eye, 
we've reached the Anthropocene era, where we've acquired the power to negatively change our biosphere, the litho, hydro, and atmosphere, the very environs that sustain us and all other life on Earth. In fact, five out of nine recognized, identified tipping points or planetary boundaries related to life, our life support systems on Earth, five out of nine have already been passed. And all nine boundaries are interconnected. As one collapses, the others will soon follow. The story for me always begins with these two numbers. There's 7.4 billion people living on our planet today with 240,000 added every single day. So control of the growth of our population is an issue, certainly. But it's not nearly the problem as the number on the right, another type of population and what we're doing to the planet. The number on the right represents the fact that there are more than 70 billion animals living on our planet that we raise and eat for food each year. And this repeats itself year after year in growing numbers, and that's the problem. In fact, this 70 billion number is quite impossible to pin down. It's very much on the light side, because on any given day, you might find up to 1.7 to 2 trillion chickens in the world and 1 to 2 trillion fish in the world on their way sooner or later going off to slaughter that year. Well, let's look at a graphic about global depletion. I mean, there are other industries that contribute to this picture, but none have the comprehensive impact. Simply put, we're in overshoot mode. We're demanding more of our planet's resources than what it can supply. We've been in overshoot mode since 1973. It would take one and a half to two full Earths to sustain what we're currently taking from and doing to our planet. It's serious enough on its own merit, but it's made much more so because of all the layers of various influences that tend to bury the problem and bury its solutions. Now, what's critical for everyone to understand that this, this is not just a factory farm issue, not at all. It's a raising animals to eat issue. And we're gonna see more of that as we go along. We'll just continue refining our thoughts on global warming or climate change. First, we need to remember that global warming is just one component of the much larger, more insidious problem of global depletion, the more total effect that we have on our planet. And that's just important to understand. And it's not all caused by the energy sector. Discussions regarding global warming and climate change have now taken front stage nearly everywhere. It must be remembered, though, again, that climate change will have the effects of exacerbation. It takes events and makes matters worse. Global warming and climate change, for instance, will not be the initial cause of these categories of global depletion. We cause these things. Climate change will worsen them. Well, these numbers have caused quite a bit of controversy, haven't they? I mean, how could the meat everyone's eating cause more greenhouse gas emissions than what's caused by powering all the cars, trucks, planes, and trains that we drive and fly every day? It's hardly conceivable. But Instead of 18% as that original 2006 United Nations report stated, or even their most recent figure, 14.5%, a couple of researchers, as we know, have projected, they found that livestock could produce as much as 51% of all human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. Now, most scientific organizations are not on board with this at all yet. But there are a number of reasons for the differences between these numbers, low to high. Most important for me is the vast underreporting use of inaccurate global warming potential for methane and potential bias amongst the authors of those two United Nations reports who are well-known, respected consultants for the livestock industry. These, these lower figures are also without factoring in all the greenhouse gases emitted because of our demand to eat fish, all the fuel, refrigeration, processing, packaging, transportation, etc. And regardless of where the exact number resides, somewhere between 14.5 or, or higher, it really doesn't matter, does it? Because it, it's too much, and it's cause for alarm and immediate action. A perfect example of how this information suppressed occurs every single year during our climate change conferences, held originally in Kyoto in 1997 with a Kyoto Protocol. Last year it was held in Paris, where countries come together and they're trying to solve this global warming problem, but none of this is being addressed. Last year's conference was just held a few months ago, and organizers knew that time is running out. So agreements were made, called intended, <laughs> nationally determined contributions. It sounds a little subjective, doesn't it, to solve matters? Although by all estimates, then, these pledges are, are not going to be ambitious enough, not at all. That's because the Kyoto Protocol runs out. In just a couple of years, in 2020, there are still no legally binding commitments and climate scientists predict that warming will continue to reach a rise of nearly three degrees centigrade by the end of this century, two times higher than the goal. Well, every aspect of global depletion has a timeline. It's really not a, a question of if we're going to run out of something, it, it's when, at our current pace. One of the most critical timelines of all is that of climate change. We only have a two-year window of time from now 
to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions or we're going to see irreversible warming of our planet with catastrophic effects. It's, it's already happening today. If you do the math, though, it's, it's conceivable that we could exceed our budget, what's allowed for atmospheric carbon by the year 2050. We could exceed that without the energy sector even factored into the equation or fossil fuels, simply due to raising livestock. To summarize the connection between food choice and climate change, we have this. Climate change is very real. It's worsening and the situation is urgent. Greenhouse gas emissions that we produce, anthropogenic, significantly affect climate change. Raising animals for us to eat is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. And lastly, any food movement away from factory farms, but including grass-fed or pastured animal systems, will not solve the problem. In fact, it's going to make matters worse. More land use changes, more deforestation, a higher feed conversion ratio, more production of methane. 60 to 70 percent more methane is produced per one grass-fed cow as compared to one grain-fed cow. How important really is food choice in climate change? Well, we're, we're currently pumping in 54 gigatons of carbon equivalent greenhouse gases into our atmosphere each year, 54 gigatons. If we converted all global cropland that's currently growing crops to feed livestock, and we also converted all pasture land with grazing livestock to regenerative plant-based systems producing food for us to eat directly, we'd find ourselves at a net negative greenhouse gas scenario, complete mitigation. All greenhouse gases currently being emitted by all sources would be sequestered into the soil, gone. But we just can't seem to get our leaders on track, despite the evidence. And again, climate change is just the first step. Then it's connecting that to food choice, and then that to animal agriculture, and then finally it's a connection to all other aspects of sustainability or global depletion. So we have to get through this first step, which, which might seem a little challenging at first, doesn't it? I mean, this is from, this is from one of our leaders, right? So, and I wasn't going to talk about politics tonight, but I mean, th this, is, this is why we're in a little difficulty we are. And I'm going to show you one more. I mean, I don't know who he's pointing at here, likely me. <laughs> but this is one of the problems we have. Given the predictions of nearly every climate scientist in the world, our business as usual approach to climate change isn't working. Therefore, it's time to get outside the box. It's time to take the right action and to do it now. Looking at solutions, prescriptions, this is what we have. The first approach is to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel. Seems pretty simple, just like Al Gore and everyone else recommends. But renewable energy infrastructure, such as building solar and wind generators all over the world to reduce climate change, that's a good idea. But it's projected to take at least $1 trillion per year for the next 34 years to develop. Well, we don't have, we don't have 34 years. We barely have a year. And we really don't have $34 trillion. So another solution to climate change would be we could stop eating animals today. It doesn't have to take 34 years. And instead of $34 trillion, it really costs you nothing. That's, that's the prescription to mitigate, not adapt to, but to mitigate climate change. Well, interspersed, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So important. Interspersed throughout our discussions are a few themes. One theme is how information about this particular subject has been suppressed, even mismanaged. So much so that objectives of many important meetings like the climate change conferences and other organizations, well, those, those objectives aren't being met. And that all begins with the words we use. How clear are they? Are they conveying reality? These are all food movements that superficially seem to make sense. It makes sense because they make you feel as if you're going in the right direction because they're going away from factory farms. They're going away from processed foods. That's got to be a good thing, right? Maybe. Maybe not. Do any of these words mean sustainable? How about, how about healthy? Many would want you to think so. Now, how about the word humane? Does humane equal sustainable? And, and if it does, which it doesn't, <laughs> who is it that tries to define humane for all of us? Incredibly, there's one person that the USDA and every humane certified organization in the world relies on for that definition of humane. One person. Does, 
Does humane even equal humane? And what does real food mean? I have issues with its precepts. I mean, real food is a, is a very large movement today, getting larger and larger amongst college campuses today. And uh, it's defined by being uh, local, fair, sustainable, and humane. All four of those things, that sounds terrific. But that's terribly misleading. For instance, uh, I brought an example with me. This, this is not real food. It, it's, a, it's a Vega bar. It's, it's not real food because it, it's not local. Yeah, it's made way up there in Vancouver somewhere. And, and, and worse, it's processed. It's all put together for you. But it does have sachi inchi seeds, fair traded, four different types of organic plant protein. It's really put together quite beautifully well, but remember, it's not real food. It doesn't fit their definition. Whereas these other food items I'm about to show you are considered real food. These. O over over 19,000 chickens are killed every minute. Every 60 seconds in our country, 19,000. I suppose that's pretty real. And if chicken, beef, pork, or fish, or any other animal products considered real food, what, what about these? Real food too? Sure, why not? They come along with it, and they're free. <laughs> Pretty cost effective. So unlike the Vega bar, these, these poor things are considered real food because they're local and the real food people think they're sustainable, healthy, and humane, but they're not. They're none of those things other than perhaps being local. Therefore, the real food movement is flawed Seriously flawed because the definitions they're using are flawed. Similar to every other food movement on this list, just because something's local doesn't at all mean that it's sustainable or humane. It doesn't even mean that it should be eaten. The only thing that local means is that it's not very far from here. And here's a new uh, animal agriculture movement that's gaining momentum called climate smart, especially with academics. It's a nice thought, but, but given the global warming predicament that we're in, Shouldn't we be growing and eating only plant-based foods, which would make then this food movement the climate smartest? I mean, we, we all want to be smart, right? But, but who wouldn't want to be the smartest, right? <laughs> the most recent food movement in the United States and in, and in Europe that's gaining considerable traction is, is this one, eating less meat. Okay, so let's see. The logic in this food movement is that if you're doing something that's recognized as being wrong, hurtful, and unnecessary, just continue doing that wrong, unnecessary, hurtful thing a few less times each day, right? That, that makes sense. Again, it begins with the words we use. Are they, are they conveying reality? This represents a food term that's constantly used improperly, right, Jake? This is a protein, perhaps a rudimentary protein. It doesn't have the secondary and tertiary characteristics, but nevertheless, it's a protein. So when you're thinking about eating protein, this is what you should be thinking about, as in, I need to get my protein today, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Protein is not the little buddy looking over my shoulder. <laughs> That's my research assistant. <laughs> it's a pretty good research assistant. It's pretty obvious. And, and what about this couples therapy session? I mean, they're having difficulties between the two of them because one of them's constantly be called protein, and it's not her name. <laughs> and she makes it very clear that she doesn't like it. <laughs> uh, protein's also not the guy on the left here, and yet that's what people are calling protein, aren't they? The guy on the left with the overzealous smooch <laughs> and the excessive amount of saliva that he always has. <laughs> he, 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 he's, a, he's a cow. He shouldn't be called protein. I mean, he shouldn't be called protein any more than the guy on the right, which sometimes we do call him protein. <laughs> and yet we do. In fact, his name is Plato. <laughs> it's pretty special. One of the most pressing concerns we have today regarding sustaining our life and future life on Earth is our supply of fresh water. From 1941 to 2011, the world's population tripled, but freshwater consumption quadrupled. There's a growing gap between worldwide demand for water and what's really available. With so much demand, there's expected to be a 40% shortage in freshwater supply in just 14 years. What you decide to eat has every single thing to do with this. Scientists are very concerned about water scarcity, but I think it's really a matter of water management, isn't it? Instead of focusing on technologies, we should be first looking at choices. Is, is this a good choice? How about, how about this choice? 
are, are any of these good choices? These are all global averages, water footprint network. Are these good choices compared to, say, say these choices? It's quite a difference, wouldn't you say? Hey, it, I mean, it requires over 400 gallons of water, over 400 gallons of water just to slaughter and process one cow. Although water on Earth remains constant, the consumptive form it happens to be in does not. Four out of five people now live within 30 miles of a water-damaged area, meaning soon to run out or polluted. There are nearly 300 transboundary river and waterways on Earth where multiple countries share a vital running water supply. As we see water shortages over the next 14 years, we'll surely see droughts, famine, human sickness, and then we're going to see conflicts, social unrest, mass migrations, and even wars. Indeed, those living downstream will be fiercely battling those living upstream for their water rights. Climate change will make these matters worse, but not cause them. Food choice and virtual water trading through food, especially with water-intensive products like animal products, will play a much larger role in this unrest than energy or fossil fuel use. In many areas of the world, freshwater scarcity coexists with hunger and poverty. Afghanistan, Sudan, and Saudi Arabia are raising livestock and crops to feed them while running their water supplies dry. 60% of Ethiopia's population suffers from hunger and thirst, and yet their dehydrated land is being used to support a growing herd of over 50 million cattle, the largest in Africa. Syria is desperately in need of a number of things, aren't they? But they're also in need of freshwater supplies for their thirsty 18 million humans, but at the same time, they're attempting to provide water for 47 million cattle, sheep, and goats. And so it is with Pakistan, Mongolia, Russia, India, China, nearly every country in the world struggling with an increase in human population, dwindling natural resources, and being strangled by their meat and dairy culture. And this has to include the country of California <laughs> and, and, and most of the Southwest United States. Regarding freshwater, and despite the recent effects of El Nino, things aren't going so well in California, but have they given thought to where most of the water supply is going? It's a good example of the lack of knowledge. It's not to golf courses, and most of it's not to lawn care. Between 60 and 70 percent of the total consumptive water usage in, the, in California goes to livestock and crops to feed them. Using less water to brush our teeth, flush toilets, do laundry, or less time in the shower will save two gallons of water per day for each act, on average. That's important. However, eliminating meat and dairy from one's diet will save, on average, over 1,000 gallons of water per person every day. If California, as an example, stopped growing alfalfa for livestock for just one year, the amount of water saved that one year would be enough water to provide drinking water to the entire human population of the city of San Francisco. Not, not for that one year, but for every year for the next 66 years. So then these are the timelines that are facing us for fresh water. And it's not really anything that we shall feel comfortable with. And try to remember about virtual water, something that's grown here that's shipped somewhere else or the other way around. And what about this phrase? Millions of people proclaim their love of fish every day of the year, and yet we eat them. In fact, for 98% of all individuals in the world, this phrase, I love fish, actually means this. I love to eat fish, doesn't it? I mean, that's, that's what it means. Because if you love fish, as in loving your cat or your dog, you certainly wouldn't kill and eat them, would you? No, I, I don't think so. I really don't. Again, I think it's how we use our words, isn't it? There are three principal ways our oceans are being destroyed, and all three are caused or at least heavily affected by food choice. Raising and eating animals on land causes warming and acidification of our oceans, which is now irreversible in our lifetime. Surface runoff from livestock operations on land has caused more than 550 nitrogen-flooded dead zones around the world, comprising more than 95,000 square miles of areas completely devoid of life. So any meaningful discussion of the state of our oceans has to first begin with frank discussions about land-based animal agriculture. But it is fishing that has the largest impact of all. Incredibly large amounts of sea life are taken from our oceans in three ways. First, they're taken as target fish. You know, that, that's the one you want to eat. 
Fish are also taken out of our oceans to feed other fish, uh, grown on factory fish farms, part of the aquaculture movement. And lastly, fish are also taken as bykill due to the first two types of fishing. Oh, that really doesn't leave too much in our oceans now, does it? In fact, our oceans are being ravaged, and yet everyone we know still eats fish. Fragile, interdependent, and poorly understood ecosystems have been devastated. Over 90 million tons of fish were caught last year, with quite a few more millions of tons of bycale, which are all those other innocent sea life caught, killed, and discarded in the process of trying to catch that targeted fish everyone's asking for. Bycale includes juvenile fish that will never see their way to maturity. All seven of the endangered sea turtles are affected. Sea lions, birds, dolphins, even, even, even whales are bycale. Of the 17 major fishing stock areas in the world, all of them are either overexploited or on the verge of collapse. 87% of all of the world's fish species are affected, considered heavily depleted from overfishing practices. That's quite a bit of damage. But it doesn't matter today because along comes this word sustainable to then justify continued extraction and harvesting. I mean, how is this word even used in the fishing industry? Who defines it? Who monitors it? And with less than 1% of all of our oceans being regulated, less than 1% of all of our oceans being regulated, that's right, then who decides on enforcement? The whales, whales caught in fishing nets and fishing lines die a very slow, painful, and agonizing death while trying to free themselves over a period of six months' time on average from the time they first became entangled. Six months' time from the time they first became entangled. We owe these whales much more than this. When researchers in ocean conservation groups discuss the topic of overfishing, they, they typically point to the tons of wild fish caught per year and those tons raised from aquaculture, and they call this production. And I look at this much differently and certainly more accurately by adding to these figures another 28 million tons per year of IUU, which is illegally caught, unregulated, and unreported, which I don't even know how they come up with a figure for that. And also, bykill you need to add to this, which amounts to perhaps another 200 million tons of sea animals per year. So it's not accurate at all for researchers to call any of this production, because in reality, what we're doing is destroying. You know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch is aptly named because that's exactly what they're doing. They're watching all this happen while promoting it to be continued. And irrespective of climate change, it's predicted that we're going to lose nearly all commercially recognized sea life by collapsing of, the, of their various systems in our oceans by the year 2048. And so it is with fishing under the sustainable label. Target fish are becoming extinct. We move on to the next fish in line, creating cereal depletion, and then other sea life up and down the food web, sort of exploitation of the food web, are becoming extinct. A cascade effect, all part of the collateral damage that begins with us. Coral reef systems around the world are in serious trouble, aren't they? The Great Barrier Reef has lost more than half of its coral cover since 1985, and most would think and tell you that it's due to pollution and climate change, but it's not. The primary cause of coral reef death there and throughout most of the rest of the world is not pollution and it's not from climate change, it's from overfishing. One of the most, press, one of the most important factors in balancing coral reef ecosystems are predatory fish like sharks and, and rays, but we're killing them too, Qu quite a few of them. One third of all shark species are nearing extinction. We're killing nearly 100 million sharks every year. Why? Well. 40 to 70 million sharks have their fins cut off like this and then they're thrown overboard to die. So we can eat shark fin soup or shark meat. Shark fin soup is, is declining slightly, shark fin meat is increasing. And it's terrible to see this, isn't it? And I know what some of you are thinking, you're saying to yourselves, I don't eat shark fin soup. And not me. And furthermore, it's banned in 11 states in our country, Hawaii being the very first. And, and isn't that great? It is. But again, over 98% of us do eat fish. And by eating fish, any type of fish, we're doing this to 60 million sharks that are caught each year and killed in fishing nets and fishing lines as bycal while you're eating your target fish. So go ahead and ban shark fin soup all you want, but why would you stop there? Why should we stop there? If you're truly concerned about sharks, sea turtles, whales, and the state of our oceans, you should ban fishing. 
killing krill now has become a very big business. But, but you don't need to eat krill or any other sea life to get your omega-3s. Uh, however, krill is fundamental to the survival of almost every animal species in and around the Antarctic. And krill numbers have dropped by 78% since 1980. Well, I could go on and on for a few hours. But here's the point regarding our oceans. It's no longer a problem of overfishing. That, that, that term was accurate in the, in the early 1800s. Today, it's about fishing. Not to worry, because now we have fish farms. 49% of all fish consumed worldwide are produced from aquaculture, which is growing faster than any other food sector. One reason for this tremendous growth is the very false illusion of environmentalism. But regardless of where the fish on your plate comes from, now or in the future, is, is the process of, of catching and slaughtering fish, is that process humane? And if it isn't humane, then, then why do we do it? Do any of you know what nociceptors are? Especially polymodal nociceptors. They're, they're sensory receptors associated with feeling pain. That's how we feel pain. All of you have them. Most mammals have numerous polymodal nociceptors in and around their face, their head, their neck. So do fish. They can feel this. In reality, there's no such thing as sustainable commercial fishing today, especially if you apply the three factors of how that word sustainable is defined by the industry itself. That's how they define it, those three factors. And please note the sobering statistic at the bottom of the slide. With continued extraction, warming, acidification, and deoxygenation, our oceans that we once felt were so robust will very soon be unable to support what few life forms remain in and around them. So the timelines for our oceans look like this. This is not science fiction. Uh, it's not something I made up last night. It's, it's reality. And quite, quite sadly, this has all happened on our watch and the generation just before us. What, what you're looking at is what we've created and then are now passing on to future generations. While palm oil has front page notoriety. Tropical rainforest loss due to livestock has occurred at a four times greater rate than that due to palm oil. In the last ten, 25 years, 10 times more tropical rainforest has been lost due to raising livestock than, than what's lost due to palm oil. So be concerned about palm oil, certainly. But then be 10 times more concerned about livestock and animal agriculture. This is what a few thousand to a million year old rainforest now looks like because the world's food priorities are with eating livestock not with being stewards of other things, as we should be. This is the sad result. By the year 2050, most of our rainforests will be gone. And the few patches that remain will have already been way past their tipping point. This, of course, means that all the millions of species that originally lived in these rainforests will be gone. The indigenous tribes and shaman, the medicine men, will be gone forever. The once abundant water systems destroyed, and of course, their deoxygenation and, or oxygenation and climate regulatory mechanisms will be lost for the next few millions of years, which is how long it took these rainforests to develop. And we've wiped them out in less than 50 years. So many predict that we have only 60 years left before we run out of topsoil, because one half of all Earth's topsoil has already been lost and just in the last 100 years. Most of the world's agricultural land suffers today from severe erosion. Well, we need topsoil to grow food. At the beginning of this erosion desertification equation, is deforestation. That's at the beginning. And the majority of deforestation can be blamed squarely on animal agriculture. In fact, less than 2% of all crops grown worldwide today are with organic methods for direct human consumption without going to livestock. Less than 2%. So I know there's always someone that's, that's asking, why don't we just grow more topsoil, right? You know, you know in large test tubes similar to how we're going to grow more meat in the future, right? Or, or, or sometimes I get this, well, why don't we just make more soil with a new app on your smartphone? <laughs> yeah, uh, we, have, we have technology to do that, don't we, Siri? <laughs> My phone. Uh, well, we do. It's called nature, uh, and it requires 500 to 1,000 years to grow just one, top so one inch of topsoil. This is how much land is being used to raise livestock, 45% of the enti uh, entire ice-free terrestrial landmass on Earth, 45%. If we factor in the 230 million acres of public land lands used for grazing, 
then livestock account for 97% of all land used for agriculture in the US. The reason animal agriculture creates so many sustainability problems is quite simple. It's terribly inefficient. It wastes resources, energy, and lives. You can produce 15 times more protein from plants than you can from animals on any given area of land, anywhere. You can produce anywhere from 2,500 to 60,000 pounds of plant foods on one acre of land versus 50 to a couple hundred pounds of animal products on that same one acre. And this is a statistic that needed updated, to be updated. Livestock now produce 7 million pounds of urine and feces every 60 seconds in our country, which is 100 times more than the entire human population produces. To be sure, world hunger has many layers of complexity. One of the larger reasons is tied to poverty. But another significant factor is the looming shadow of our current demand to eat livestock and fish, which is indirectly tied to poverty. In fact, eating these animals ultimately affects food prices, food availability, and policymaking, which then suppresses progress in developing countries. Last year, there was considered a record harvest grain in the world of over 3 billion tons that were produced. But nearly half of that was given to animals in the meat and dairy industries. Each year, 77% of all coarse grain produced in the world, 77% of all coarse grain produced in the world for food is consumed by livestock. So we can't blame climate change, droughts, or flooding for the world's food security issues. Clearly, the difficulty is not how or if we can produce enough food to feed the hungry or the growing human population, but rather where all the food we produce globally is going. Solving world hunger is not as simple, though, as giving them the grain that would normally go to livestock. It's, it's really not quite that simple. The solution, particularly in developing countries, re requires a multi-dimensional approach to sustainability, established on many levels simultaneously with organic plant-based food systems at the nucleus, which is the only way we can do this. The model for success at reducing hunger in developing countries, I believe, should look like this. This is what we're working on in Mozambique and a few other areas right now with a few models that are trying to develop this. No livestock. We're losing other species on Earth at an unprecedented rate. Plants, animals, insects. The current view of most scientists is more related to the rate of extinction rather than the exact number because they simply can't keep up with all the extinctions. Now, why are we losing so many extinctions? And right now, we're losing anywhere between 1,000 to 10,000 times the background rate. There's so many species that we're losing. It's 1,000 to 10,000 times the background rate that which we've seen for the previous several thousands of years, which used to be about two to four species going extinct per year. And regardless of the metric, it's now a massive and embarrassing amount. Well, what are we doing about this? Nearly all concerned researchers agree that the primary reason for loss of biodiversity is by pastured or grazing livestock on land, loss of habitat, and by overfishing in our oceans. But these organizations are not meeting their targets. In fact, loss of biodiversity is accelerating. They'll never meet their targets until they properly address our choice of foods. The Living Planet Index shows that we lost more than half of all vertebrate animal species in the world since 1970. One half are gone. It's no surprise to me that during that same 40-year period of time, global production of meat and dairy products quadrupled. What we're doing to other forms of life on Earth is unparalleled in the history of our planet, where, where, where one species is, is causing the mass extinction of nearly all other species. So it reminds me of this somewhat well-known and very appropriate comment that if all insects on Earth disappeared, within 50 years, all life on Earth would end. However, if all human beings disappeared from Earth, within 50 years, all forms of life would flourish. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that buying local has little to do with sustainability other than from a, an economic standpoint. It's a very solid idea to help nearby farmers, no question about that. And that, that's very important. But in fact, transportation is only responsible for 4%. Just 4% of all the fossil fuels used and all the greenhouse gases emitted in the entire food production process. So it's much more relevant to, to view this by using a complete life cycle analysis, which I can talk more about later. You know, 2014 was designated the year of the family farmer. I was happy to see that. It's a great thing. But we must remember that it is the type of food that matters most, not the size of the farm or the miles traveled. 
So by all means, support your local farmer markets and cooperatives, but it has to be plant-based in order to make any sense. So how do we solve this? Knowing and doing. Over the years, I've been proposing two categories of solutions. First, there needs to be widespread sweeping education of the public and those with a platform of influence. We essentially need to educate the educated. And, and second, we need to implement initiatives based on that education, such as creating policies which open the doors for businesses and help new and also young farmers and help transition existing farms from animal agriculture to plant-based systems that will work for us. Beginning with a reallocation, I think, of the $500 billion per year we spend globally subsidizing the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. $500 billion per year. So I have another solution dealing with accountability, which would get us on track much quicker. And it's what I call the eco and health risk tax. This is something we've never done before because the true cost to our environment to our own health has always been externalized, hasn't it? It's never been directly paid for where their heads always turn in the opposite direction. Just don't want to see this. Well, this is not a carbon tax. I'm not proposing a, a soda tax, which vastly understates the problem. But if we can do this for soft drinks in Berkeley, we, we can certainly apply the same concept to meat and dairy products that affect us on a much, much grander scale. Well, this is one of the questions of our future, isn't it? This in aquaculture. Um, it's a topic that's gaining momentum, and I find it's a natural path for, for most people wanting so badly to hang on to the false sense of needing versus simply wanting to eat animal products. It's a path of least resistance, isn't it? Let's look at a couple different ways to answer this question. And, and there you have it. That's one way to answer it. I mean, he thinks so. And so, and so does Mark Bittman and many, many others that are, uh, that are on platforms, that we, we place on platforms of being food experts. My, my thought, though, is that we need to be fully aware of the consequences of our food choices, not partially aware. And we need to understand what we're doing to all aspects of global depletion. And we need to know the urgency of the problem. This is not a when we get around to it type of a problem anymore. So another way to look at this isn't grass-fed sustainable issue is if, if we gave each one of you an acre, one acre of land to grow any food you, you choose, uh, we, we, you could try to raise one grass-fed cow thinking it's fully sustainable, just like that New York Times multiple time multiple times best-selling author is telling everyone. But in most areas of the world, one acre is not enough. Not at all. You're going to need 5, 10, 20, even 50 acres for that one cow. So if you use your acre for your one acre for grass-fed livestock, you'd end up with about 50 to 400 pounds of a type of food that's then implicated in a number of disease states after you eat it. And along the way, you've produced 6 to 7 tons of methane and carbon dioxide, and you've used 1 to 2 million gallons of water for that one cow. Or instead, if you use your acre of land to grow vegetable, fruit, grain combination, or nuts, you produce 20 to 60,000 pounds of food that's infinitely healthier for you to eat and for our planet to grow. It's astounding what you can produce on that one acre over the period of time it would take for you to raise your one grass-fed cow. And for those who still think that eating any animal is sustainable, then it's time to introduce or understand this concept, optimal relative sustainability. That'll work. How sustainable is it to raise and eat any animal product in a relative sense as compared to plant-based foods? How can we best use our resources? What foods will have the least effect on climate change? Which foods promote, best promote our own human health and which are, the, which, which, which are the most compassionate? All in a package, in one package. This is the way we need to start viewing things in a relative sense as to then how to achieve optimal sustainability. Now, about the Go Meatless on Monday campaign. I have to make this real clear. Now, assuming you're subscribing to this, or some of you do, or you have friends that do, and assuming that you eat meat on the other days of the week. So if you do this, if you, if you go meatless on Mondays, well, then you're going to be contributing to climate change, pollution, global depletion of our planet's resources, and your own health on only six days of the week instead of seven. I mean, you're going to be creating a false justification for your actions on those other six days of the week. In other words, please, Let's not rest on the laurels of what you're doing right only one-seventh of the time. And what does eating less meat really mean? Just in the one hour I'm speaking here today, say from 7 to 8 o'clock, over 8 million animals were slaughtered for us to eat in that one hour. 114,000 tons of grain were fed to livestock that were raising. But during that same one hour, 
354 children in the world have died from starvation. 6,000 acres of tropical rainforest were destroyed and replaced by cattle or crops to feed them, and over 4 million tons of greenhouse gases have been dumped into our atmosphere by livestock. So therefore, I'm advocating a much, much different approach than what the United Nations and others suggest when they state that we should simply eat less meat. Because with that approach of eating less meat, well, only 7 million animals will be slaughtered in the next hour. Only 113,000 tons of grain will be wasted, leaving only 353 children in the world that will starve to death in that next one hour. Isn't that what less means? So unlike Mark Bittman, Michael Pollan, all other eat less meat advocates and food gurus, I think these numbers should be zero. I sure do. It's. It, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's easily attainable. Uh, there's no magic involved. There's nothing new has to be invented. There's no new technologies that have to be employed. It's simply with what we choose to eat. And one more important definition that needs refinement, ethics. The ethical consideration of what we choose to eat. The topic of conscious eating has always been about animal rights, animal welfare, hasn't it? The life and death of other living beings that that, that, that we consume, how they're treated. Ethics has always been about this, and rightly so. But I think it's time to view conscious eating or ethics in a much different and a much, much larger context. It, is it ethical, for instance, for any of us to, to eat food that causes the extinction of other species if we don't need to? Is it ethical for the vast majority of humans on Earth to contribute or at least heavily contribute heavily or cause irreversible climate damage, loss of ecosystems, resource depletion, while 2% of us are living our lives by way of food choice to protect Earth? Is it ethical for any of us to use our planet in a way that exacerbates world hunger and extracts the potential for future generations to survive? Is it even ethical for 319 million Americans to impose their diet-related health care costs on the 7 million who choose to eat the right foods? So you see, it's time, I think, we that we all rethink ethics. It needs to be framed much differently than just with animal rights. In fact, one of the chapters in my, in my most recent book is titled, Why Should I Pay for What Everyone Else Decides to Eat? <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, we need to pose that question, don't we? It makes a little sense to continue doing what our predecessors did in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s when we didn't know any better and there were far less mouths to feed and more land and water to do so. Do, do any of you still use a typewriter or a feather quill pen to write a message with? How about the Pony Express or the stagecoach to send those messages or to travel? And you thought the internet was slow. <laughs> yeah, well, your great-great-grandparents did. And what about candles or kerosene lamps to read with at night? Anybody out there still using candles or kerosene lamps to read my books with? <laughs> anyway, well, why not? Why aren't you using these things? I'll tell you why. Because they're obsolete. That's why. We've outgrown them. They're inefficient. They don't fit. And so it is with all meat, dairy, and fish. The world on a global basis can no longer support the production of these things. Just like the typewriter, just like the stagecoach. We need to evolve past them, and we need to do it today because the clock is ticking. You know, almost everything we do, every decision we make every day is based on our culture, what we've learned, what, what someone else has told us to be acceptable or necessary. After realizing that, that bloodletting here wasn't so healthy for us after all, we miraculously stopped, even though we've been doing it for more than 3,000 years. Well, there are culturally driven practices that we are accepting today, especially with food choices involving all animal products that are much more unhealthy for our planet and for us than bloodletting. And by all counts, we don't have 3,000 years to get it right. Many organizations are quite concerned about how we're going to feed the growing human population expected to reach 9.6 billion by the year 2050, because demand for food, including meat and dairy, will nearly double from what it is today. And looking at the future, we do have some, some troubling trends. This is where many of our problems begin, with organizations like this, with statements like this. So we have to work ourselves through this. The demand to raise, slaughter, and eat animals is hardly believable. I mean, last year, the one-year figures looked like this. And with these type of figures expected to double 
by the year 2050, what exactly does the phrase eating less meat mean here? Maybe, maybe 68 million tons of beef? At this stage, one would have to ask, what are all the conservation groups doing about this problem? You know, the, the, the ones we give our money to. All these groups are concerned about climate change. I mean, no problem there. But not, none of them have made a statement about the profound effect eating animals has on our environment, despite the fact that it does. And despite the fact that we've entrusted these groups to preserve and protect our planet. Well, where's all of our donated money going? <laughs> Aside from those conservation groups who are obviously in the dark and they're, they're working on it, but they're in the dark still, there are a few researchers and organizations that are quite aware of the dire predic predicament that we're in and the very short timelines we're faced with. Any of these folks that you see will bluntly tell you that our species is in a state of unsustainability and that we can't remain on this course for very much longer. But not one of them, not one of them is connecting that final dot. They continue telling us that our survival is in peril and we need to change. Okay, but, but, but change what? And they make it very clear that we need to stop over-consuming and over-producing. But over-consuming and over-producing, exactly what? Again, fossil fuels and waste are very easy targets for them to point their fingers at. Well, why aren't we getting the truth from those with platforms, those who are guiding us? It's because of three reasons, I think. First, they're comfortably unaware. <laughs> or second, some are partially aware and they simply can't bring themselves around to making the right statement because they themselves consume animals. After all, how can we expect one of our leaders to guide us toward health and restoration of our planet if they can't even do it for themselves? And lastly, many of our leaders are afraid. They're afraid. They're afraid they're going to lose their audience. Even with the 17 new sustainable development goals established by the United Nations last September, the effect of animal agriculture is not properly positioned anywhere any, in any of their goals. Therefore, it's highly unlikely that any of these goals will be met. Every five years, the U.S. dietary guidelines are updated. These guidelines, as many of you know, influence many programs in the United States, including the $16 billion per year school lunch program, among others. For the first time ever, earlier last year, it was recommended by their prestigious advisory committee that these new dietary guidelines take into strong consideration our environment. So I was all excited. And it set off campaigns like this one in the positive direction with over 100 major health and environmental groups in support of these recommendations. But it also set off a massive backlash from the meat and dairy industries who heavily lobbied. Well, because they believe that scientific evidence regarding the environment and food has no place in the U.S. dietary guidelines. And just a few months ago, these, these guidelines were finally released, and there was no mention of the advisory committee's recommendations about our environment due to the success of the lobbying efforts of the meat and dairy industries. It was very disappointing for me to see this. Uh, so I'm very encouraged to see grassroots efforts like these then to pick up the pace. Wonderful new documentary films to help matters. And I'm not sure if any of you had a chance to see Cowspiracy yet. Uh, great. And of course, we have this new film. And I'm, yep, and I'm happy to say that there will be another four new films that I've been involved with had the honor to be involved with that will be released in the next few months about this topic. This one to keep an eye on. It's phenomenal. Food choices. A snapshot of your wonderful state of Hawaii looks like this. You import 90% of your food. You import 90% of your food each year at a tune of about $3 billion per year. You'd like to be self-sustaining regarding food production. Who wouldn't be? You don't want to import all that food from somewhere else <laughs> because you have the best food right here, don't you? Fruits, vegetables, nuts. It's the best. But 83% of your agricultural land isn't being used to grow food. It's being used to grow cattle. 83%. That's right, you're using 17,000 acres in your state for fruit and vegetables, but 760,000 acres are being used for pasture livestock. That's 50 times more land than what's being used to grow plants for direct human consumption. 75% of the fish species of Hawaii are in critical condition, with many species near your larger islands dropping in numbers by as much as 90%. The reason for this decline is not a mystery. It's from overfishing. Your state leaders have set an aloha challenge to double the amount of food produced and consumed locally by the year 2030, which means it'll take 14 years for you to get to the point where 20% of your food is grown locally. 
That, that's not good enough, is it? No, we need to strengthen that. In fact, two of your legislators once said that the quest for Hawaii to achieve 100% food self-sufficiency is impractical, unattainable, and perhaps impossible as it imposes too high a cost for society. So we clearly need to redefine for them what cost to society actually means. And perhaps we can raise their awareness levels about food choice and sustainability and offer these two legislators what's possible rather than letting them spread their belief about the impossible. Knowing everything I've talked about today, there's certainly ample reason for feeling quite discouraged. I know that. Anyone feeling discouraged out there? Yeah, I understand. Regarding loss of our planet's life systems, what we're done to our planet, there's so much bad news around us in the truth. And even with increased awareness, it seems we'll be constantly fighting an uphill battle. But in the midst of potential despair, there can be found great news, I think. There's an easy solution to global depletion. We don't have to destroy our planet or ourselves to eat. In fact, it's the other way around. But we must change, and it is a choice. We need to substitute, replace, eliminate, the practice of raising, slaughtering, and consuming animals, and we must do it now. Now, there's great news in all this because the food choices that are optimal for our planet's health happen to be the very same food choices that optimize our own health. How easy is that? You know what? I'd like to tell you all that we, we, we can all be heroes. That's right, all of us. We, we could even be superheroes swooping down and saving lives and saving our planet with every single thing we eat, every single day. Yeah, a superhero. I, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling much better already. <laughs> you know, something quite telling happened at the end of our, the annual Global Climate Change Conference held, uh, that we talked about, it was held earlier. In her closing remarks, the executive secretary of the conference, Christiana Forget, has provided a summary of the conclusions of 200 nations, NGOs, and researchers by stating this about our future, about greenhouse gas emissions, and about climate change. She said this, the science is unquestionable. Therefore, despite the obvious effects on the industry itself, we must call for the elimination of the use of coal as an energy source. And she said, we must do this immediately. Notice that she didn't say that, that we should all use less coal <laughs> or for us to use only local or humane coal. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I didn't hear her say that. And I also didn't hear her say that we should all go coal less on Mondays. In fact, she said we should eliminate coal, even though coal carries with it roughly the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions that raising livestock does. And coal has no real direct effect on water scarcity, world hunger, loss of biodiversity, extinctions, and all other areas of, of global depletion, but raising and eating animals does. So the door has been opened, hasn't it? Perhaps inadvertently by Ms. Figueres and 200 nations. But as far as I'm concerned, the global stage for massive food choice change has been set. If there's an imminent threat to our planet and to us, which there is, well, we should certainly be able to call for its elimination and for it to be done immediately. So I encourage and challenge everyone to become more aware about your food choices and seek more accurate definitions and terms. Understand and appreciate the timelines and tipping points that we're faced with. And then let's all commit to making a difference. But not just with our own health or our own life. No, let's, let's commit to making a difference in someone else's life and a difference in the long-term health of our planet. But, but let's do it now, not later. We might not have a later. And let's think about making a difference every day of the week, not just on Mondays. Be a superhero for those around you, guiding them and saving lives every single day. That, my friends, is what sustainability and positive change and pono to achieve it is really all about. With that in mind, let's all of us today here in this room, let's, let's all of us go out and inspire others to become aware. Thank you so very much. It's certainly been an honor for me to be here. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Real privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so very much. Thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Mahalo to all of you for coming tonight. Have a safe return home. Good night, everyone.